there, everybody. It's Jeff. Now, I hope everybody's doing okay. Uh, we had a, a good few days out here in Maine of uh, some nice uh, summer-like temperatures. It was uh, on Monday it was like 72 degrees here. <laughs> Very unusual for this time of year in Maine. Uh, but right now, today. Uh, it's like 50, 56 degrees, so we're, it's starting to cool off now. We're getting some cold air from from uh, the northern part of the uh, continent here that's coming down our way. So sooner or later, you know, it's, we're going to be in the sub-zero temperatures. <laughs> um, <coughs> well, last night I was watching this uh, this uh, movie. Not, it wasn't new, but it was... Uh, uh, a movie about uh, Carla Homolkin, um, and if you don't know who she is, she uh, is a woman, uh, a Canadian citizen, who, with her uh, husband, raped and killed uh, at least three minors, and uh, and her sister, her younger sister as well. And uh, I guess the movie was kind of like focused a lot on on Carla's point of view of everything and you know the name of the movie is called Carla by the way and uh, I guess what they were trying to do was trying to explain you know to the audience how what her her version of the story was that she told to investigators you know and it was based on an interview that was given to her uh, by a, a psychotherapist I guess or a criminal psychologist who interviewed her uh, because at the time that uh, that she was being interviewed there was a possibility she could get out early from her 12-year sentence which was plea bargained for her um, so she would give information to uh, investigators about her husband and the shit he was doing um, it caused an uproar uh, in, in Canada that she got a slap on the wrist for what many thought she was really the perpetrator of, I mean, you know, especially the fact that she assisted uh, her husband in raping and, uh, uh, and what she says was an accidental killing of her sister, you know, by drug overdose or some damn thing. But she went along with it and they videotaped the whole fucking thing. Okay, this happened in what, 1990, 92? So, <clears throat> uh, yeah, she was trying to, t you know, explain to the doctor how she felt trapped uh, by her husband. Like, she couldn't really go for help because she was afraid of him. But at the same time, uh, there were, like, many opportunities, you know, during this period where she, uh, where she could have, you know, fled. Could have gotten help, could have gotten away from him. You know, could have spilt the beans on everything he was doing. Now, you look at this the picture of these two, and, I mean, they... At the time, uh, they looked like kids, basically, you know, and I guess they, they were in a way. I mean, it was like in their early 20s. And uh, uh, Paul Bernardo, her her uh, husband, uh, I mean, Christ, he looked like, uh, he looked younger than her in a way. I mean, it's just, <laughs> so, but he obviously was demented. And, you know, they don't really explain a lot in the movie uh, what made him the way he is. It was more about Carla herself because she was such a focus for a lot of contention about the whole the whole situation because um, they just couldn't believe that she was innocent or that she could just go along with, with uh, doing all these things, watching him rape women in their bedroom. Um, and, you know, because a normal, a normal person wouldn't act like that. I mean, they would they would just run. I mean, but he would tell her up front, you know, I'm going to go pick up another girl. I'm going to bring her back and rape her and stuff like that. And she'd be like, okay, yeah, okay. And I'll see you later. You know, so it was like, you know, who does that? <laughs> you know, I mean, who in, the, who in their right mind does that sort of thing? I mean, that's not normal behavior. So, yeah, when, when she was explaining this to the doctor, the, I mean, they, the, the doctor was even kind of like, you know, and you didn't feel jealous or anything at all about what he was doing and and she was like well it made him happy you know I wanted him to be happy 
And I'm like, oh, so if he wanted to go uh, bring down a fucking building with uh, 1,600 people in it, if that made him happy, you'd, you'd say, okay, go ahead and do that. You're like green lighting a fucking homegrown terrorist, okay? Uh, to me, that's aiding and abetting, right? And she deserved to be locked up in prison for as long as, uh, as, as uh, Paul Bernardo was, which was life. The, the two of them were, were together in that from the start to finish. Um, and the fact that, you know, they, people just could not get over the fact that, you know, they assisted, that she assisted this fucker in, in, uh, killing her sister, you know, he, this guy had a, he, she was 16 years old, I believe, and he, he was attracted to her little sister, and big time, okay, even after they got married, he still warned her, so, she figured she'd give, uh, well, and plus another thing is, you know, uh, Carla wasn't a virgin, but her her little sister was, and he didn't. He wanted to have her as being the first, you know, to be the one to break her virginity. I guess I don't know. When this fucker's head, screwed up head, that was important to him. So that's what you know. She gave him her sister uh, as sort of a gift uh, to have to screw somebody that was that was still a virgin. Okay, uh, and. I'm thinking, you know, you know, this is, this is so bizarre. I mean, you, you wouldn't even think it was like a, a real story. I mean, it, you know, but life often outdoes fiction, you know, and, and the, the whole, you know, Carla Homolkin and Paula Bernardo uh, thing was just, was just that. It was crazy. I mean, it was just, you know, uh, worse than Bonnie and Clyde. I mean, it was like insane. And a lot of psychiatrists tried to diagnose her while she was sitting in in, in, uh, in prison. A lot of them really couldn't come up with a diagnosis. They um, some you know they they give a diagnosis and then they go back on it and say, no, nah, maybe it wasn't that. You know they they just couldn't figure her out because she she had this ability to detach herself from emotions. Okay, so if if what her husband was doing would make her upset, she would just. For you know, ignore it in some in some super natural way, and just go with it. Basically, at first they thought maybe she was getting sexually aroused from from what he was doing, but then they said no, because you know she's she doesn't really give emotion that well, you know. So it couldn't be that. I mean, if she was to get sexually aroused by it, then you know things that she said that they did together would have been a little different, but. Uh, so they, they, uh, you know, they just keep going back, but the, you know, the, obviously she's a psychopath. Okay. And they feel she's lied about things. I mean, about her involvement in a lot of the killings and stuff. They just feel like she, she's holding back, um, for whatever reason. And, uh, when her, her time came up for an early release, uh, it was denied her. Uh, saying that she's still a tremendous danger to the public, you know, she's not well. And when she served her full 12 years, and it was time for her to get out, she could only get out under nine conditions uh, that she had to do certain things, you know, like contact people when she was going to move, or you know, if she's going to be out of town for a while, that they need to let she need to let law enforcement know. So there was a whole bunch of stipulations that they were gonna let her out after 12 years that she needed to follow. And I believe she still has to do that. She's, she's 50 years old now and she's still living in Canada, but um, she still has to do this even now. Uh, and uh, people, you know, if when they see her, you know, she's sort of, you know, a marked woman now. I mean, people just hate her and the press, whenever they know where she's at, they, they go after her. Because it's still, it's still controversial. It's still, you know, they feel like they got a murderer walking amongst them. And, and I guess they do. I mean, if she hadn't met Paul Bernardo, her life would have been bizarre as it was. I mean, if she had these weird, this ability to do these things and stuff like that without feeling, uh, you know, she definitely would have lived a life of some kind of maybe criminality or even just, uh, you know, she wouldn't be able to get along, you know, with, with people or something like that. Um, so the two, these two people were like, uh, 
the perfect match for a, a, a match made in hell. You know, they fed off each other. And uh, she tried, and you know, her version of things to say that she was really upset with what he was doing and all that, and he, she wanted it to stop. But uh, there was no real evidence of that that they could even point to to suggest that her psycho psychology would even would even uh, think that she ever felt like she was out of you know out of control or in a situation that was out of control. Be a part of the entertainment value of a lifetime. I loved it. It was the best performance I've seen in a lifetime. I loved the show. I liked it very much. He's a very entertaining man. It's well worth the money. Now, appearing in Charlottetown, coming to Halifax, November 6th to the 18th, and St. John, November 20th to... Okay, so we're back. And, uh, yeah, I'm talking about Carlo Homolkin, who was, uh, you know, a, one half of a team of uh, a duo here that went around raping and killing young girls. And, uh, you know, they would drive around aimlessly through Toronto and different parts of, uh, you know, Quebec and Ontario, you know, just going everywhere looking for the right one. You know, they'd see a girl on the sidewalk they'd, and they'd, they'd, they uh, would pull over and they'd uh, create a, a, you know, like a situation, like say, oh, can you help direct us to this or, you know, show us how to get there. You know, they were trying to set her up. And the minute, you know, the girl or whoever would, uh, uh, you know, would, would go along with it and stuff, they, uh, her, uh, Carla's husband, Paul, would come up behind her and just whack her or something over the head and knock her out. And uh, then they'd, uh, um, they'd take her to their home and the two of them would get involved in, you know, basically raping and killing this, you know, the girl. And this was, this was going on for, what, three years, I guess, before it finally all fell apart and got caught. Um, but Carla trying to say that, you know, it was done without her consent and all that, and that she was trying to uh, stop it, doesn't come off as, as true to just about everybody that knows the case. And I kind of feel like, yeah, it can be. I mean, it went on long enough, right? She could have had, there was many chances she could have got out from under it, uh, you know, from this thing. I mean, so the police definitely would have protected her if she felt threatened by this guy that she couldn't speak out against him. But I think what it was is she didn't want to come out and say anything because she knew she was a, she was responsible or at least part of the fucking problem, the, the crimes, and she didn't want to get herself in trouble. So maybe she was hoping that there'd be an opportunity where she could just uh, get Paul to take the whole, the whole, the rap for the whole thing, and she could get away with her part of it. You know what I'm saying? I think that's what it was. I think she was just waiting for her uh, for an opportunity where she could sneak out from under him and letting him and let him take the blame. You know, but the police were were catching up to this guy pretty fast. And by the time they got him, I think it was too too late for Carla to to figure out a way to wiggle herself out of it. So she just didn't want to go to prison. Um, so she, you know, plea dealed her way out of it, where she'd only get like 12 years, and that was it. Um, meanwhile, her husband got life, and and uh, so that's what they were doing. But uh, I think that's what it was. She was she was more in her, uh, uh, nervous about uh, herself getting caught uh, doing these things with Paul and that the police wouldn't would uh, put the blame on the both of them equally 
you know, and she didn't want to go down for any of that. So she was trying to figure out a way she could uh, ride the thing out with him and then find some way to, to pin the whole the whole batch of crimes solely on him so she could find a way to get out of it. But, you know, she wasn't that smart to be able to pull something like that off anyway. Um, because at the same time that she was going through all this shit with him, um, you know, she's, she, her, they'd have friends come over and the friends would know about what the, what was kind of going on there. They knew there was something not right about their marriage. I mean, so they were putting out all kinds of friggin' red flags to people, uh, to, to, uh, you know, to say that, hey, you know, these two are up to something no good and, uh, it's got to stop, you know, and it just, especially her own, uh, Carla's own family. I mean, they, 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 she was getting beat up by Paul all the time. And they'd have fights, and her mother would cut and uh, would come by and get her, and bring her home, and then she'd go back to him the next day, you know, basically. And uh, so they, they, there was enough evidence to go around that there was something not right with that marriage, and from you know from the start, and they needed to they needed to bring him to the stop. I mean, they certainly could have gone to the police about the friggin' abuse that she was getting with him, but she wouldn't take any file any charges, I guess. Um, so, you know, that right there shows you that she was really uh, <coughs> more concerned about getting out from under the bigger crime of the uh, the murders than she was about stopping her husband from beating her, okay? So that's, uh, to me, that, that says a lot right there that, you know, even when the police were there, I mean, she could have stopped it, you know, nope, she didn't do it. She didn't take the olive branch or, or take the opportunity to get out of there. She stayed right with the son of a bitch, and um, and all the all the tears and everything that she said that you know she couldn't get away from this guy. You know it was all for nothing. I think it was just uh, just an act that she was putting on for uh, for investigators. So uh, when they released her in 2005, uh, they uh, five years after that she tried to get a full pardon for her crimes. Uh, by the by the crown <laughs> and I'm surprised that they even tried because um, you know I, you know things the people the public perception of her was pretty hot and they just when they found out she was she had the balls to try to f go and get a pardon for that they it just it just brought everything right up to a uh, right up back up to a head again the people were just mad as shit they were you know they were protesting and everything and uh, obviously they denied it to her um, so, uh, that was in 2010. And like I said, you know, her, her own, her friggin', uh, goal has been to try to clear herself of any wrongdoing. Like, you know, she, if she, you know, like she just, like, like, like I was saying before, like she was trying to wait for an opportunity to pin the whole thing on her, on her, uh, husband. Okay. Even though blood is on her fucking hands, right? She just wants to make it seem like, well, he poured it on my hands. I didn't do anything. Okay, and we both, we everybody knows that's not that it can't be true. Okay, he, she was part of the fucking team that would go pick up these girls on the street that made her just as guilty as him. And uh, the fact that she had the nerve to go and ask for a pardon after what she had done is another attempt again to try to detach herself from Paul Bernardo's, uh, uh, you know, lust for friggin' raping and killing. Okay. And it's it's just that they they keep her under a tight leash. They they want to know her whereabouts at all times, you know. And uh, <clears throat> and I'm thinking, well, you know, if they feel that way about her, that they can't trust her to be on, you know, be out of prison, then maybe they shouldn't let her go in the first place. <clears throat> you know, maybe it would have been better if they'd have just put her in a, in a psychiatric hospital or something like that to try to figure out what the hell's wrong with her, you know, <clears throat> instead of just cutting her loose. And, you know, I always think that about a lot of these, a lot of these crim, uh, criminals and stuff that go to prison uh, for years and stuff like that, you know, for a heinous crime, it's life or, or they're on death row. And I think, you know, these are opportunities where psychiatry could try and figure out you know why these people ended up the way they did is there is there, were they born with some kind of a brain uh, dysfunction or you know or, or, you know because you know the mind is very sophisticated 
uh, organ and you know it, it doesn't take much to damage it in order to create a, 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 a deviance in a person's personality you know it's really really not that difficult I mean the, the mind is so is so fragile and stuff in, in ways and uh, even you know because you know we, we have people that are born and we see physically birth defects okay that's easy to pinpoint but what if the, the birth defect is in the mind okay how do we know you know where to look for that if if there is and the truth is we don't and the thing is we could we could figure it out or isolate it if these people were given if doctors were given a chance to interview or work on these these people that are serial killers and find out what in Christ you know happened to them uh, it was it birth or was it upbringing or what was it that made them the way they are and I think that's that's what they need to do I think they need to figure that out um, and I think it would it would probably if they could if they could you know un to understand the mind better that would they'd be able to maybe stop some of this these serial killings and stuff that go on uh, in our in our country or even in the world I mean because like I said this happened in Canada you know so I feel like Carla Homolkin is one of those people that really needs to be under a, a microscope here, and they need to really figure out what the hell happened to her. Um, was she born that way to be deviant this way and, and, and go along with some asshole and, and his quest for you know murdering and killing, or <clears throat> you know was she physically damaged at some point in her life? Did she? bang your head on something you know you know what I'm saying there's got to be a reason there has to be a reason people just don't act like that if, if it was normal then there'd be a whole lot of people acting like that that all kinds of women would be doing that sort of thing or men okay that these things wouldn't be so rare and the fact that they're rare suggests that something out of the ordinary is had created this problem all right <clears throat> so you know it'd be nice to think that perhaps they could figure it out and uh Maybe, maybe someday they will. I don't know. But anyway, that's pretty much all I wanted to say about that. That movie, anyway. Um, and like I said, the name of the movie is Carla. And if you haven't seen it, you should see it because you know it's it pretty, pretty uh, gruesome. But you know, at the same time, you got to remember this is this is coming from her point of view, what she told her doctors and stuff when they interviewed her. Um, and uh, you know, that's where they're. The material is coming from, so um, you, can, you can see that you know in the movie she was she was trying to play innocent, you know, in a, in a way. <laughs> so, if you have anything you want to add or a comment, please do so below, and uh, I'd be happy to read it or respond to anything you got to say. And uh, everybody, take care, and uh, I'll talk to you again another time. So.